by the end of this show, we're hoping that we can help you or your husband reawaken the protective instinct that all of us men are absolutely gifted and privileged to have the opportunity to be protectors of our family. And it's a wonderful gift that we have as men. But there's a lot of forces working against us taking up that role. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Love Safety Net. Welcome to our new podcast. It's the second installment in our podcast series called Reassessing the Sexual Contract. And with me today is my beautiful wife, Kim. Kim, can you hear me? Are we, we good? Yes. Yes, I can hear you, Steve. Fantastic. I love this new setup. Really great idea. Thank you. We don't have to squeeze into the one shot anymore. No. It's much more comfortable. So hopefully everyone's going to enjoy the program. Today, we're talking about a, a very serious topic. We know that most of our audience is women. And if you are and you have a boyfriend or a husband who you think might need to hear this show, we'd really hope that you share it with him. Our intention is that lots of men are going to listen to this show today. So the kingdom of bastards, what are we talking about? Why does the marriage contract matter to women and children and the world? So the sexual contract that we're reassessing now, what is it about a kingdom of bastards where we have one particular man thinking that he's hit the jackpot or won the lottery because he gets to sleep with a lot of women, right? Imagine that. A guy gets to sleep as, with as many women as he wants and just has as many children as he wants and bastard children all over the town and all over the countryside. Why is that such a terrible thing? I mean, why can't a man just enjoy that kind of sexual freedom? Well, let's talk about that. Kim, we came up with this topic today, Kim, this heading today, The Kingdom of Bastards. It was based on a fascinating book called The House of the Spirits. Can you just give us a quick overview on why that uh, book was so important to and to the work that we do now? Mm. Well, it was such an amazing book. I mean, Isabella Allende just shot to fame from her debut novel, which really doesn't usually happen. I think someone, I can't remember who said it, but a very famous novelist said, now the perfect novel's been written. We can all just relax and, and um, not have to worry about writing anymore. It really tells the whole story of this, this man who really works very, very hard. He builds this, this beautiful house in South America. He clears the land. He works really hard, except he's raping and sexually exploiting the local peasant women who he finds easy to overpower. And what happens is that by the time he does find a wife who he really treasures and he has children with her they are really quite blind and unaware of the envy and the the just really dangerous landscape that they're actually living in uh, and that unfolds as the novel unfolds so I mean really the answer is just envy I mean our work is based on emotional intelligence and Envy is real and, you know, bastard can be a loose term these days because a lot of people don't marry at all and they still are a family unit and they still look after their children and I'm not calling those people bastards. Mm, um, yep. I mean, I think that the whole reason that we think of the, the name bastard as such a bad thing is because of that, that situation where if, if a man has a family that is his real family, and, and that may even be a second family, you know, he leaves his first wife and then has a second wife and, and a second family and neglects his first family and, and just treats them like that was all sort of some kind of mistake. Um, it, it really does create a, a lot of envy and a lot of anger and and really 
just so much animosity and 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 really does threaten the the wife and the children of the family that he loves the best right so it's it's a real situation where uh envy is a really important topic you raise there because that's a highly emotionally charged state of mind to be in right so envy has its own kind of uh, velocity and its own influence on our decision making and and it creates hardcore resentment i guess so if if a man is in a situation where he thinks that his joy is outside of his own family well that's creating the potential for competing interests so if somebody if, if a man is looking for sexual gratification somewhere else apart from his wife that creates not only a split off of his time and attention, but it also creates this kind and money. of and money, of course, <laughs> it creates this competitive environment with other people that aren't necessarily connected with each other, or mm. perhaps shouldn't be connected with each other. Mm. And if his wife is, is unaware of this, which often they are, it really, it leaves them incredibly vulnerable. Yeah, so we were talking earlier, Kim, and, and before this program, and we were talking about awakening the, uh, the the parental or the protective instincts of that a man is gifted with, as I said in the intro. At this point in time, we have a lot of people uh, feeling as though their treasure in life or their rewards in life is something outside of the family. Let's just talk about a common scenario here. I think that a lot of us are not really prepared for the complexity of a relationship before we begin. If you've never been in a relationship, you don't know how complex it is. And you only mm. find out how complex it is once you enter into it and stick at it for a while and realize how complicated it is. But there's a common saying, and I'm trying to just present a, a common sort of mindset here that's spoken amongst men, particularly here in Australia. There's this idea that working through problems in a relationship is a drama let's say mm. I don't, I don't, you know men will say i don't want the drama of having to talk to my wife about having to deal with this negotiation i want to do this and she wants to do this but she gives me nothing but drama which is a mm. terrible way to present it because it's not actually true drama mm. is something quite separate a complex negotiation in the family is is really difficult and of course it's very difficult for everyone to get what they need. Mm. But two heads are better than one. And that's also the, the real joy and the, the satisfaction and the meaning of a relationship is where you do get to that point where you can negotiate and, and even realize that if you strongly disagree about something, well, you probably have an opportunity to come up with a fantastic creative solution right absolutely <laughs> because the more you disagree about stuff well there must be two ways of looking at the situation there must be more information than each of you is really considering and the the bigger the disagreement the the more important it is that you're patient and you talk things through and as you say don't see it as just some drama or something to avoid so that you can just go out and find your joy somewhere else like you mentioned before that it's like no you're committed to protecting your wife and and your children and that's really your main role in life when a, a team comes together and achieves something we we love that as human beings isn't that why men watch sport yeah ah oh, totally 100 percent. but then it doesn't seem to translate into what we're doing with our wives and girlfriends this is not how the dominant narrative uh resonates in men's head we're almost prodded into saying hey you shouldn't uh, give so much time to your wife. You shouldn't give so much time to this drama. We need to be looking after ourselves. One of the common kind of examples of what I'm talking about here is, is fishing. That's just one that was in my family. My father was right into fishing. It was just an excuse for him not to liaise with the rest of us. You know, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a serious uh, distraction 
He had his joy in fishing. Everything was about the fishing trip. He worked very hard and provide for us, you know, my sister and I, and it was, that was all okay. But this fishing thing was where his joy was. It was separate to us. You know, it was something that he did with his friend and his father, my grandfather. So, but that became a competing interest. And in my family growing up, that became a very serious problem to the point where my, my, my parents actually separated when I was quite young. But that's just an example of, of where I think we're going here. If our joy is, is focused outside the family and that becomes a competitive uh, arena for the other parts of, uh, of the family dynamic that needs to evolve. And when we talk about the dynamic evolving, what we're really talking about is men being able to you know, patiently and respectfully negotiate what needs to happen within our family, the family decisions. Two heads are better than one, as you said, Kim, giving it that time to happen. Because if we don't have that as a focus, if, if men don't have that as a focus, well, we're very easily uh, lured into a, a new kind of mindset, which says, hey, you should just go and look after yourself. Why don't you go fishing? Why don't you go to a bar? And for me, it was going to bars. I loved going to bars, pubs, drinking beer, um, watching the sport, being with guys. That was my joy. It's like, ah, oh, I don't have to deal with the kids and Kim for a while. I'm just going to be here and I'm just going to be a bogan. Talk mm -hmm. shit you know, talk shit to the blokes, which is sort of, you know, code for just wasting time, basically, mm. you know, <laughs> and not putting enough time into it. So this does relate to the kingdom of buses, because what we're saying is that our interest and our time and our priorities as men, as husbands and boyfriends and fathers needs to be primarily focused on protecting what we do have, which is a relationship with our wives. And we were talking earlier before Kim about the bull, the example of the bull. What does the bull do? He stands around in a paddock eating grass all day and not really doing much at all. But then, you know, his, his role is to protect the flock. Herd. The herd. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> to protect his herd. And um, so it's not just his herd. I think we sort of thought about this. It's a good example of domestic heaven that our family is something that we can protect and that we're instinctively wired to protect that. And that's a beautiful role. Okay, it, it does cause some um, conflict at times, but it's real. Don't all of us crave that somewhere inside that domestic heaven? I what think we, so. How we treat cattle and whatever maybe that domestic heaven for cows doesn't exist, but it's a nice picture of, you can, you can really imagine that, the, the bulls just protecting the cows and, and the calves. And that's just so necessary. And with men, I mean, you mentioned the examples of fishing and going to bars and whatever, and that's really astute that, that really anything that's you're treating like, has more joy in it than your family is putting that at risk because you're not there protecting them you're not there involved in their lives you're not there uh, seeing what's going on in their lives and and really particularly when you have children and you need to be aware of what's happening in their lives a lot of men will treat women like they're just crazy psychos because they're not happy with a relationship where the guy just comes home and expects to be fed and expects sex. Well, you know, women are human beings. We've got our own agendas. We've got our own emotions. We've got our own story. We've got our own things going on in our life. And we really do expect that our husbands are going to be aware and interested about those things and protect, particularly seeing when we're in trouble or when we might need protection and what when we might need help um, rather than just coming in and expecting hang on you you know is the house clean am I getting my food am I getting hmm. um, am I being worshipped and looked after here is this all to my standards which can really bring this very judgmental attitude into 
the home environment with men and and being judgmental is really the opposite of being protective isn't it yeah 100 percent. and that's <clears throat> that's where i think it's really important that we we make a distinction here what you were saying kim was really interesting because i think what a woman does expect from her protective husband is that that she will be protected by him exclusively like this is an exclusive contract this is the expectation that we have of each other mm. and i and i know there's people that talk a lot about how open relationships can can work i don't see any research that supports that i don't know of anyone that really can really claim that that's a very good way of looking at things or a nice way to make a build a platform for society i just don't think so if we're talking about reassessing the sexual contract here, we really should be upfront, 100%, down the line, unequivocal that a relationship between a man and a woman should be exclusive. And that's what a man needs to get through his head. But what does happen in society is that we are bombarded 24-7 with the objectification of women. And I think it's becoming a real issue. It's not just a it's not just rhetoric to say that we've got to confront the sexual objectification of women in society. It's like a cry. It's a cultural crisis. Now it's beyond a boutique sort of interest for people that like to talk about things. This is a seriously a crisis. Kim, yeah. you've, you've, we've worked with hundreds, you know, potentially thousands of people over the last decade and a half where you've heard story after story after story of how infinite, not just strict infidelity of a, of, of, of a sexual kind, but where a man's interest will deviate away from his family and mm. cause the most extraordinary chaos Yeah, mm. that will radiate out into society, not just for the family. Mm. Getting back to the theme of the kingdom of bastards, it's like if, if you can see that, that fishing or bars or even just any interest that a man really considers there's more joy in it than being at home with his wife and with his family if you can see that that is potentially leaving his family at risk well how much worse is it when infidelity comes into it where you know the guy is not just going to bars or fishing but he's looking at porn and he's having affairs and but that's just standard in our uh, popular culture at the moment. You know, it's just considered that's just the norm. Oh, getting the opportunity to have sex with some random woman is getting lucky, isn't it? Mm. You know, for guys. I mean, how can that be luck? It's like <laughs> that's like the, the potential dangers involved for his wife and for his children i mean that that's just how far off base we've we've come with all of this and we watched a great movie the other night i mean they called it the it's a marketing holocaust is what's going on in the world and if it's not addressed i i have really grave fears for the world in how much it is just 24 7 all around us women being objectified women being objectified as sex objects as just people to provide food for men but that still can be disrespected and and just put down and really just have their feelings and their needs completely ignored how how far is that away from the picture you were giving steve of of the the bull protecting the herd yeah 100 like, percent. how how do we how do we flip this switch in men to show them where their joy and their meaning in life and where their purpose really is i don't well, know i'm not a man you have to tell me <laughs> how do we flip the switch what split the switch with you well there's a couple of ideas and and i think one's important that you explain kim because you've written about this in your books in the past and in your blogs uh the 
I guess the the concept put forward by Jung or the premise put forward by Jung that a man needs to rescue his own woman inside himself or his anima. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I think it's a really important first step to answering the question you just asked. Sure. I haven't written about that in my books. My books are more about emotional intelligence and psychology, and I'm certainly not an expert in Jung. Um, I hope I get this right. Um, but I know there's stages in the development of the anima in a man, just like there's stages of development for the animus in, in a woman. Um, we all have that other side of us. Uh, and if we don't liberate that other side of us, we really don't reach a potential and, and don't find a lot of meaning in our lives. Mm -hmm. And the first stage for men is really very two dimensional. The woman is just the, the picture, the, the porn image, and she doesn't have a voice. She's just the pretty woman that he's attracted to and it's very important she does find a voice but she also needs to be rescued and I can't remember which order those stages go in right. um, but I know that the the imagery is really clear is it's that the all of the fairy tales are based on it or so many of them <laughs> rescuing the damsel from the tower um, rescuing her off the train tracks, you know, the rest, the man rescuing the damsel in distress. And I think that's just happening really worldwide now. <laughs> yeah. At a cultural level that, that men really have to, they have to liberate their own anima. They have to liberate their own female aspect enough to not just, treat feelings as something that they can just go uh drama i'm not going to get involved in that mm. i just rather go fishing um well because all that does is is make you an emotional idiot you know right. um and judgmental I mean, like my book emotional stupidity it it's just there's nothing there's just nothing in that to be proud of to be uh, emotionally stupid and yet we see emotionally stupid men constantly now, constantly in their behavior. Our politicians, the leaders of corporations, they're just doing emotionally stupid things. Um, the lengths that they will go to to avoid sitting down and having an emotional conversation with someone and just following some emotional logic in terms of being able to empathize and put themselves in the other person's shoes for long enough to come up with a higher level of understanding that solves the problem. Yes, it takes courage. Yes, it takes a little bit of skill. But we can all learn this. And, and emotional intelligence is something that you don't even peak in your ability to learn these skills until you're in your 40s. It's like, it's not too late. And even when you're past that, it's not too late. That's just when it peaks. How do we awaken the men to say you it's time that you save your wives and your mothers and your daughters from the train tracks from the <laughs> tower and give her a voice and actually let her have the important role in your life that she wants to have, you know, because she probably really loves you and cares about you and has all sorts of stuff to offer you. And if you let your two heads come together in your decision making, amazing things will happen in your life that you could never have imagined on your own. Well, it's a it's a wonderful first step, I guess, Kim, if we can get to that point where we can understand that there's a negotiation that needs to happen in a relationship that we have to first. So negotiations based on understanding each other, I guess, is is one of the steps in a negotiation but also having compassion and empathy for the other person. Men and emotional are going to regulation and very first off emotional regulation. So that, yeah, when someone disagrees with us or has a different idea and we don't feel like we've got time to listen to them, we all feel frustrated. We all feel 
some anger about that but you know maturing enough to be able to say okay yes we all feel that way but we we're adults now and we need to get on top of that and actually say okay no obviously if we disagree this much that we're starting to feel heated and angry about this we really need to take some time to sit down and really be honest and and cut the bs and and put it on the table and say and and each partner give it their best and say okay where's the higher understanding because if you do that there's always a solution right if everybody puts their best to it and everybody has optimism that there is a sol- going to be a solution well there there's always going to be a solution and the solution is always going to be better than what each of you could have thought of on your own. Yeah, pulling away separately and trying to yeah. compete for the resources that are, yeah, in, 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 that are scarce at times. We do have to negotiate. So that goodwill is really important that you talked about there, Kim. That's really important. We bring goodwill to the table. We don't have to bring the solution to the table. And this is one of the things I'd like to say to the men directly is that, yes, as a protector, we need to be a protective type person we need to take that on that role but when there is a conflict we also need to bring not just compassion and understanding because that's as you say Kim it's always hard when we're emotionally triggered to just to rationally talk through things we do get we we get emotionally hurt and triggered by things but if we're able to bring goodwill to the table then the solution will come goodwill is the key but that goodwill that is beautiful fertile ground so whenever there is a conflict there's fertile ground for us to to work through something okay Mm. we may feel this emptiness or this hunger that we don't have this a solution straight away or i don't have the solution that i think is the solution because you know that's my you know male emotional stupidity that i'm going to admit to right now is that i, I think, think i've got the more, answer I, I think you're more i've right just away. got the answer and i don't have time <laughs> yeah. that's my that's my approach in generally okay well i know the answer let's not talk about it we don't have time to talk about it mm. but we're all but that's working against what we had raised earlier which is that we're not rest that the man a man is not going to rescue that other aspect of himself, the female who is objectified. So we we do just that we have to we have to admit now that we're in a society where you know, the sexual objectification of women is just is is wall to wall. It's everywhere. It it hasn't stopped. It's got worse. It's getting worse. And we thought it was getting bad when our children were young, Kim, like in the in the nineties and the early two thousands, you know. The uh, MTV just became this soft porn program, you know, and we were horrified by it. We just, you know, couldn't believe what we were seeing. But it's getting worse and it's drifted away from just sort of sexualized images of women and degrading images of women. And it's moved into the language and it's moved into the culture of the music as well and the lyrics. Where What you know, happened to Nina Cherry and, and Queen Latifah? <laughs> Yeah, they had they had good solid messages of <laughs> intensely uh, proud and and strong women, great role models, mm. right? Mm. Artistic and creative. Joni Mitchell. So that's where men are missing the opportunity to rescue the damsel in distress inside us or give her a voice. I think it's really important that we give her a voice and give her a seat at the table. One of the most difficult things for for men I think is to uh, admit to other men that their priority is to create a beautiful and peaceful world create the domestic heaven that that all of us deep down inside want we all really want that but I think men are very awful well they're they're not able to admit Mm. it and that's sad and this is where our love safety net programs really trying to reverse that hmm well i think the men they think they're going to do it by being critical and judgmental Mm. and it doesn't work because that doesn't create a domestic heaven no 
where the person who's meant to be the protector has turned into the person who is critical and judgmental. It's vital for a man to play that protective role for them to be compassionate and understanding and empathetic. And they are not weak qualities. Right. It takes courage to care. It takes courage to be able to face uh, disagreements and keep a steady hand and a, a measured approach. And we offer in the Love Safety Net members area just all sorts of resources to help men. But men need to realize that they need this. They need these processes, how to resolve conflicts, how to make decisions together. I mean, men understand that they need these processes when they're in business. They understand that they need these processes when they work in a corporation or when they run a club. They understand that there needs to be a process that isn't always exciting. That's, that's often, right. it takes patience and it takes maturity to sit down and really give everybody the airtime that they need so that everybody's views are heard and so that you can come up with a consensus. But if, if we know that this needs to happen in a business level and an organizational level, well, of course it needs to happen in our families as well. And I just don't see anybody except for us talking about this. Yeah, and sure. I've been working on these ideas for so long and the people that understand it and put it into practice in their family, it, it really helps them. But way too often where all we're doing is only training women in domestic self-defense. And that's really what we teach is domestic self-defense. And it's just gotten so bad that that's what women need training in is, is how to defend themselves in their own homes from their husbands, emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, sexually, right across the board. Steve, what, what do we do? How do we wake up the men to just remind them of where their real masculinity is, where their real role is? Guys don't need to feel guilty about this. You've been so brainwashed by mm. people that want to sell you a Lamborghini and a bottle of scotch and way too many drugs. And I mean, the things that are being pushed on men out there 24 seven are just unreal. Occult sex rituals. I mean, that, that stuff is just embedded in everything around us now. It's all just occult sex ritual. Well, <laughs> if there's guys watching this that are into that kind of stuff, well, you only get the magic of the guy and the girl coming together if she gets a voice and she gets <laughs> a say and her brain's involved in it and you let her argue with you and there's a true ne negotiation um, because I don't know any women that want to be involved in that kind of crap. Sorry. <laughs> but seriously. Seems very, yeah. It's, it's, it's not. But, but it's everywhere. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, it's just I, 100%. Everything, that being masculine is having a Harley Davidson and, and drinking bourbon and, you know, hanging out in strip clubs. And it's just like, wake up. Yeah, these that are all... doesn't make you a masculine man. It makes you a tool. Right. It also makes you a consumer who's obsessed with gratification. So what Kim and I teach is, is about saying, okay, you can't just blame someone else for your problems. You really have to take stock of what you're doing, but you have to be aware of what's going on around you as well. And what is going on around us is that there is this obsession with consumerism. And, mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the people that are marketing, those <clears throat> items you were well, just talking about. As long as it makes in, money, it's all fine. Yeah, that's right. It makes money, it's great. Made, yeah, made a million dollars last year. It's, it's fine. So we're all good. Oh, you, you must know? be a legend. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's Harley Davidson, like you say, or a visit to a prostitute or a strip club, or if it's a, a donut, or if it's, um, you know. Having an affair with another married woman. So it's you know, all, on, yeah. on 
they got apps for that now. Right. But that's gratification. We're, we're being sold this instant gratification, which is the opposite of what we were just talking about, Kim. We're saying, okay, there's no instant gratification when there is a, there's a serious conversation that needs to happen within a family. But we're, we're in this better position. We're in a better position to realize this fertile ground for... Uh, now, it's very important we don't say compromise, Kim, right? Because mm. this isn't, you know, developing good negotiation skills within your own relationship is not about compromise. And I think that's no. what you've made that distinction before in a no, previous program. You want to mention that again? It's really important distinction, I think. No, compromise means that you really haven't done the negotiation properly. It means you haven't given it enough time because it shouldn't ever be a compromise. Compromise is only just going to lead to conflict down the road. It means it, that's the, it's the melding of minds. Negotiation is better than sex because when you get good at it, isn't that true, Steve? Because when you get good at it and you really are able to be intimate with each other and really sit down and put your ideas on the table and see that where there's disagreement, there's also opportunity for maybe a really higher level of understanding to come in than what you had before it's not about compromise it's coming up with better solutions than you could have come up with on your own right. and if you can't do that with somebody why marry them <laughs> seriously well i think then the answer to that question is is that i think a lot of men are sold the idea that they can just get married oh yeah i'll give it a shot for a while i'll do my best you know i'll do whatever but anyway, i'm going to leave the door open for when things get tough and when I don't really like the way things are going, I'll just leave the door open and I'll, and I'll go and, and screw someone else. Yeah. You know, this is an important part of our podcast here. And this is the whole theme of it that creates this idea of the conditions or the scenario for the kingdom of bastards to happen. It's where a man is. And we're living in it. We're living in the kingdom of bastards. hundred percent. A man's taking his hat of responsibility and he's throwing it in the fire. He says, I don't need to be responsible for the, the woman and the family that I've, I've said that I'll live together with forever and ever and um, in sickness and health. And he chucks that responsibility away. But I think our mindset is before we even enter into relationships that we're going to leave the door open for that. We, we think, oh, well, I don't have to be responsible. I'll just do my best. But if, you know, if it gets too hard, I'll just, I'll just disappear and I'll just, you know, dump everything. Go fishing. Go fishing. That's the one. But I mean, <laughs> that's, it's, it's almost become an overt aspect to modern society here in the West. Anyway, I can't speak for. Oh, other it's parts just of the standard. World. It's just standard. So standard. It's just a cliche. It's a stereotype and a cliche. Hmm. And how do we give this back to, to guys that you don't need a Harley? You don't need a bottle of bourbon. You don't need any of this stuff to be masculine if you want to be more masculine if you want women to look up to you and respect you if you want your community to look up to you and respect you if you want to feel good about yourself if you want to go to bed at night feeling like you've accomplished heaps and wake up in the morning inspired and looking forward to your day ahead well step into the role of being protector of your wife and your children and seeing that as where your joy is. And if that isn't your cup of tea, if that really doesn't suit you, <laughs> if, uh, fine. Well, don't get married. Don't get married. You know, don't. And don't, have a good yeah. Friend. And don't pretend like you're going to be the person, you're going to be the exclusive person for, for a woman because you're, you know, yeah. really taking, you're taking the community into a dangerous area of the woods there because there's so much potential the kingdom of us is the house of the spirits story just illustrates that so beautifully this guy who just thinks he can find sexual gratification or sexual interest sexual connection elsewhere outside of his family his decision to do that creates something monumentally destructive for his family for his children for his grandchildren for the reputation of his family which is so sad. I mean, it's hor horrifyingly sad, this story. But we know it in our own lives, Kim, the people that and we know and we've worked with. 
I can't remember whether it was his daughter or his granddaughter in the story. I read the book a really long time ago. I probably read the book 15 years ago, who he really loves, right, who in his old, older years just cherishes more than anything in his whole life. She doesn't become aware of this situation of all of these bastard children that he sired in the area where they live until she's taken hostage in some political yeah, uprising, yeah. uprising, you know, <clears throat> war that's, that's going on. This is all set in South America. And they, they're torturing her. And it isn't until they get to the point where this guy is dunking her head in a bucket of shit that a light goes on in her head where she goes, this is personal. Mm. This has not got anything to do with politics. This is actually personal. Yeah. And she doesn't even know why it's personal because right. she doesn't know this guy. She was the innocent party. She this guy who's torturing her. Horrible. She doesn't actually know that he's her half-brother. It's just horrifying. It's well, just yeah. absolutely horrifying. So one man's actions, just wanting to be sexually gratified, creates this whole situation where a woman's getting a head dunked in feces you know, a generation mm. later, and for reasons she doesn't know why. And not just any woman, but the woman that this same man who was creating the bastards loves and cherishes the most. <laughs> right. More than anything, more than his money, more than his life when he's older. That means everything in the world to him. And and so this is, you know, this is why we bastards are, are to be feared. So don't create them. You know, just well, I've got a great story it's not about getting lucky. It's not getting lucky. It's almost as good as your story, Kim, about that book. But um, there's a story, and I can't point to the exact veracity of the, the truth in this at all, but there was a particular region of the world where one particular ruler had a law that said that he's king and that he can basically have as many wives as he wants. And so that's what he did during his life. But part of the law was that when he passed away and there was to be a succession um, of, of his son to the throne, that any of the children that could verify that they were his son could come forward to claim it. But the other condition in this particular part of the world was that if you were an unsuccessful claimant to the throne, you would be beheaded. So, of course, when this particular king died, there was something like 20 or 30 bastard children on the steps of the kingdom, let's say. And, uh, and there was this carnage. There was 20 or 30 beheaded people, you know, on the steps. And there was this, this moment in, in history where someone came in and said, okay, there's, this, is, this is not okay. This is terrible. We're going to need to change these laws. We're not doing this anymore. We can't have 30 people dead on the steps just because this guy who's our king is probably a complete tyrant idiot, right? Just because he wanted to have sex with lots of women. And he's just created this, you know, he's gone, he's dead. He doesn't have to view the carnage, but he's yeah. gone. So he's left behind this heredity. So what does that do to society? What are people going to say in that situation that we're in that particular society? They're going to think, Oh, well, this is, you know, yeah, this is cool. This is normal. No, they're not. They're going to be, they were horrified and they changed the law. They insisted that it was changed. And I think there was some success there. So, um, again, we, 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 one particular man's idea of what is going to be good, what's going to bring him joy in his life, which is, you know, sexual gratification and time away from his family is not, is not the case. There's a responsibility. There's a price to pay eventually. Someone down the line is going to pay for this. And it's usually, most usually going to be an innocent party. Absolutely. And the thing is, is that scientifically and biologically with men, if you hang out with your wife and your kids most of the time, 
yeah, your interest in sex is going to go right down <laughs> right? because that's yep. just normal, isn't it? And and that it, why is that being sold to men as just such a terrible thing? As oh, if if you're not just ready for it, you know, twenty four seven, there's something about <laughs> you that is masculine. Well, that's just insane. I mean, what is what is attractive or useful or or you know in over sexed older men <laughs> seriously yeah it's I mean, pretty it's gross ugly sex is great and i'm not saying older people should never have sex but it's just like you know it, it really is a season in your life isn't it it's yeah, a right. season in your life that should be left to young people and as you get older your body knows what it's doing. If, if you're playing your role correctly as a man, as being the protector of your wife and protector of your children and protector of your community, well, your interest in sex is just going to go down anyway. That's right. Because you're going to be finding your joy in other things. Yeah. Other things that are a lot more meaningful in the end. And, and productive. And- and a lot more productive. That's in the, the thing. Year. By the time you're a bit older, you know, men, we've got these, we've got all these skills, you know. I mean, the older I get, the, the older I get, the more skills I have. There's things I can do now that I couldn't do 10, 20 years ago. You know, it's, as I've got older and, 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 and as I've, I've raised my kids now, but I've got all these skills. And Kim and I actually, we look after a lot of people uh, directly. We have a lot of people that live with us. We have student accommodation, which is part of our, part of our work. And we protect these young people to study so they're studying at university my role is protecting not just you kim and my kids who have moved out now but i'm you know moving into this role it's quite good you, you know got a big I have, herd. <laughs> yeah i've got a big herd and we actually have a female only house which is really interesting and it's great for me not because i get to perv on the girls but because i get to protect them from people that we've just described, people that are oversexed and just crazy and just want to hurt girls, you know, objectify women. We want to protect them. It's hard for me to make sure that everything's locked up properly and everything's taken care of and, and everyone's, no one's got a key. There's no keys missing or loose out there in the community that all the lights are on and the lights are working and all that sort of stuff. You know, there's a, there's a role for us men to play and I'm, but I'm grateful, you know, that I get to be, to be like that and to protect these young women. And, um, and you've been such and my life with you, Kim. You've been such a good role model for um, the boys with that as well, because when they when their friends come over and sort of go, "Wow, there's a house full of girls here," um, and sort of start getting the wrong ideas, our sons are actually really horrified by that. <laughs> really horrified by that and really protective as well it's just like they're just like no no that's not what's yeah, happening here no they, these these girls are not gratification for you these no, girls are just here studying and we're they're protected yeah by the bulls that's me and the boys <laughs> yeah, and right. our son yeah so, so kim i think and I, does that I, give your life meaning oh look 100 percent it is so it is such a beautiful thing it is so it gives me life more than meaning you know it's a it's i know that and i know that the girls appreciate it you know they and they say it to me directly they say oh, we feel you know we feel really safe that you're here that we can they can call on me and that's that's great i mean what else that's that's more gratifying than anything so they say well, i really appreciate what you're doing here you know to get a thank you is really better than sex right mm. <laughs> to be to be needed is great and, yeah and that's and that's what we've we've built here but we've built that together Kim. that's not just me respected. And respected and valued and honored and isn't that the things that men really want yes well, and know, that's that's what women want to imagine Sorry? yeah and that's what women want too i imagine to be respected yeah. and valued absolutely and that's why the men out there, they have to rescue the damsel in distress, whether it's in themselves or whether it's in the world around us. It's just who's, who's going to protect the mothers, who's going to protect the daughters. It's got to be you guys. And I would even go as far as saying, you know, protecting them from 
standard psychology from the whole Freudian idea that you can blame everything wrong in the world on mothers. <laughs> so, you know, where are the guys that are standing up and saying, hey, wait a minute, like this is a bit this is like really like everything every mental disorder that anybody ever has is because their mother did something wrong yeah. you know and it's it would rather... have to be a guy who came up with that idea <laughs> it would have to be wouldn't it <laughs> it's I a mean, rather simplistic view of the world hey us guys like simplistic you know solutions but that one was a bit of a shocker and that's reverberating and hurting us oh it's like religion now. Everybody just takes it for granted. If I'm hurting, if I'm upset, if there's anything wrong in my life, it must be because of something that my mother did to me. Uh, you know, everybody just thinks that now. It's just where where are the men that are going to stand up and actually start defending mothers and start defending their wives and well, start hope- saying, no, come on, come on. Like, this is like, Really, that was not your mum's fault. You know, <laughs> that really, I had something to do with that as well or whatever, you know? On well, I hope whatever the men, level, well, the I hope men have to start defending us. I hope it's the men that are listening to the show who are going to be the people that are going to stand up and take the baton that we're passing to them now, Kim. <laughs> because it's really important that we reassess the sexual contract. And today's episode was about the horrendous nature of the kingdom of bastards which is a reality on many levels we've got three more shows in this series called reassessing the sexual contract our next show is called dangerous parental grooming uh, how rape culture raises children we won't do any teasers about that now kim because i know that we've, we've got we've got a bit of a time issue now but we've also got another program after that, which is called Domestic Self-Defense. And Kim already mentioned that in today's program. The last one in the series, and these are all coming over the next weeks, conducting a sexual relationship that improves over time. And that's really what we're trying to, to get to. I mean, what the, the byline for that last one is reassessing the benefits of monogamy for men. So the benefits of monogamy for men are extremely important. Hopefully today's show led to some of those concepts being shared with you. And, and hopefully, I'm, this is a call out to all you guys. If we haven't awoken something in you today, I, you know, please forgive me because my intention was to awaken something in you, which is to not be necessarily like a bull that's going to charge at everything. You know, you have to be measured and you have to really know what you're protecting. What you are protecting is something so precious that is so easily broken and you can so easily chuck away to have a, a, a relationship outside your your uh, family is something that is going to not just hurt one person, it's going to hurt a, a whole range of people and it's going to destroy your reputation as well. And you're it's not clever. Gonna, it's probably going to hurt. end up hurting the people that you care about the most. That's right. And it's not clever. There was a great movie a long time ago called The Big Easy. And, and it was a little bit, I mean, without going into it, it's kind of like, it's really easy to have sex with someone. Like, it's not hard. It's not complicated. It's not clever. No. <laughs> and so what is clever is to learn to be able to negotiate with you, your partner. Negotiate with your children, which is even more difficult than that. But, you know, when you have an open heart and a big family, you know, this is an amazing thing. The fertile ground that's there for communication and for negotiation to happen within a family when you've got children as well as your partner, you know, this is, this is beautiful. You can create something amazing that you never dreamed up on your own. And I'm here to say, I do this work with Kim to help me and Kim as much as I do to help other people. We really do not have Messiah complexes. Do we Kim? (laughs) We're, you know, (laughs) we're interested people. We like being interested in things. And this is just one of the most important things, you know, of all the problems in the world, if we can resolve what's happening within families immediately, if we can do that, because we can do that, we're in charge of our own families, right? If we can do that yeah. now, we can solve a lot of problems. Well, we, we, you know, I only just got into this. We No, we both really decided to get into this in the beginning after we just had the most dreadful relationship in the world. And when I discovered emotional intelligence training, 
and started applying that to our relationship instead of psychology, um, instead of the, you know, mums to blame for everything <laughs> craziness that psychology, not all of psychology is based on. And there's a lot of really good ideas in psychology, but there's also a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of people who study psychology study it because they actually want to solve their own problems. And right. then they don't the psychology they learn doesn't solve their problems and then they have to pretend to other people that they and it's terrible they end up in a terrible situation but so I went through all of that none of that helped and but when I discovered emotional intelligence training and and I had to read through all these really thick books because none of it was really directly aimed at families most of it was aimed at corporate leadership training and sort of condensed all of that and reworked it to fix our marriage and then when that worked it was kind of like we we felt guilty didn't we we just went Mm -hmm. hang on there's so many people out there suffering should we just enjoy ourselves and and say hey well you know we just found this little treasure (laughs) for ourselves no we actually just ended up saying there's just too many people suffering out there we've got to share this and um we're we're not experts we're just people that have lived through it but by this stage i've written a fair few books and we've done you know a couple of audios together and how many articles and podcasts i don't know um i'm doing it for a long time so i really encourage so yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Kim. I, I really encourage if you're interested in getting in contact with us, we do have a members area, which is really, uh, really useful for people. It's a beautiful community in there. Very, very supportive people, including Kim and myself. And uh, if you are interested in that, we do have that on offer. There's various ways you can get involved. Um, hit us up. You'll find our link somewhere close by to wherever you're viewing this podcast. Kim, it's been, we've, our time is up. It's it's been beautiful talking to you. I hope it's it's lovely to talk to you in your office with your um, beautiful environment around you. Yeah, this is really cool. This is a really cool idea of yours. You're Thank upstairs you. and I'm downstairs. Yeah, <laughs> and we don't have such sore backsides at the end of it. Hopefully, when we have to no, jam in next and- to each other like this. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> And figuring out whether we're talking to each other or whether we're talking. Yeah, to each yeah, other. all the head turning. Great. Listen, yeah. everybody, thank you very much for tuning in. Please share it. Please share it with as many people as you can. Let them know about Kim and men, Steve. Share it with the men. Share it with the men. You can see us on the lovesafetynet.com or the NC Marriage. That's NC. That's November Charlie, the NC Marriage. Have a look. Check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and subscribe and do all that stuff that really helps us. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful night. <laughs>